Hey everybody, it's Mr. Robbins uh, back again to begin our discussion of Unit 14. So now we are kind of in the 1970s, we're getting to a part of uh, what historians would call pretty recent history. To you guys, it's still ancient history. But we are in a period where, certainly by now in the 1970s, most of your grandparents would know and maybe remember some of these events as they were occurring. Uh, maybe even some of your parents, depending on how old they are, they might remember some of this stuff too from their childhood. Um, and as we move forward to the class, every single day we'll get closer and closer to the 1980s and then the 1990s and then eventually the 2000s. So we are kind of in the home stretch here as we wrap up, but there's still some important topics that we do need to talk about um, in the U.S. history course before we completely wrap up for the semester. So let's go ahead and get started at Unit 14. And to pick up where we left off last time, we talked about the 1968 election of Richard Nixon. Now, when Nixon was elected in 1968, the U.S. was going through a lot of turmoil, both in our foreign affairs with the Cold War and domestically here at home. Um, we had seen that the economic boom post-World War II in the 1950s and 1960s is starting to come to an end. And as we go through Unit 14 and talk about the rest of the 1970s, we're going to see that there were a lot of economic issues that the country was facing, and we had many different problems causing these economic issues. In foreign policy, our entrance and how the war of, of a war in Vietnam was going uh, was not going too great. Um, and so this failure um, is continuing to challenge our prestige and kind of our leadership in the world. And then again at home, we saw the anti-war protests. We saw the development of the counterculture, the hippie culture. Um, and then many liberal government programs, uh, most recently the ones from the Great Society programs of Lyndon Johnson, leads a lot of Americans, particularly more conservative ones, to believe America is on the road for moral de decay, where you know families aren't important so much anymore, and, and not just that, but also economic collapse. Now, I've used these words, liberal, conservative, in this class before, started using them a lot more in units 12 and 13, but now I actually want to take a moment and actually define what I'm talking about when I say something is liberal or conservative, okay? Now, in not just our political system, but in political systems across the world, we typically kind of think of them as uh, the spectrum. And we use these terms left and right, liberal and conservative, to describe them. All right. Now, left and right, this idea comes back from way, way back in time during the French Revolution, where the more radical folks that wanted a lot of change, they sat on the left side of the chamber, uh, during the revolution, and the folks that were more conservative and didn't want a lot of change, they sat on the right side of the chamber. Uh, and so when we use these terms and these directions, we're basically kind of, it's a shorthand. So if we say someone's on the left, they're more willing to be looking for like new solutions to problems. They're willing to kind of change things, um, even if that means tossing out some ideas that we used to like in the past. Whereas if we say someone is on the right, that means that they are generally more conservative and they are much less willing for changes. They usually see problems with changes and how that might affect traditional culture and traditional structures. Okay. Now, when we dig down into this, we can see that our presidents kind of represent you know, usually one side or the other, with some of them kind of coming in between. Now... The one that we could talk about that's probably most relevant at this point on the left to start would be Franklin Roosevelt. Of course, Franklin Roosevelt and his New Deal program, which, which were completely new, completely made up, and, and intended to fix the problems of the Great Depression with big government programs, would definitely put him on the left side of the spectrum. Harry Truman, his successor, would also kind of fall on the left side of the spectrum as he during his time as president, at least continued a lot of the New Deal programs. He did try to implement new ones, but they didn't get passed. Now, on the right, we would have President Eisenhower, who uh, did not propose a lot of new social programs to help folks. Um, he did do, uh, he did continue many of the New Deal programs like Social Security and whatnot, uh, 
but he certainly didn't propose any new ones and no major changes to how the government worked during the 1950s. Uh, we would argue that both President John F. Kennedy and certainly his successor, Lyndon Johnson, would be on the left. Both of these guys asked for, and Johnson especially got past, several big government programs during the Great Society. Things like Medicare and Medicaid, Head Start, that all grew the powers of the federal government, let the government spend more money on these programs intended to help people in the country. And Nixon, now president, is going to be kind of another reaction to this, right? And we see that by the 1968 election with all of the craziness going on in the country, there was a large group of Americans who really did listen to Nixon and what he had to say resonated with them. And this would be the so-called silent majority, okay? Now, Nixon coined this term silent majority to, to refer to the Americans, and he said it was the majority of Americans, right? So most Americans who don't go out and protest, don't go out and, you know, um, do riots or anything like that, but not even that. They might not even publicly announce what their political beliefs are. They might not want to ever talk about politics in public, okay, because they think it's uncivil. And these folks who, as Nixon would say, their primary uh, responsibilities are to go to work, take care of their kids, take care of the house. A lot of these folks, they want a more conservative government. They don't want all these major changes that uh, increasingly liberals in the Democratic Party are trying to push through. And this is one of the reasons Nixon will win in 1968. Now, to this point, Nixon will implement several conservative policies uh, domestically in domestic policy. Um, now, this didn't mean that Nixon wanted to throw out and get rid of all of the Great Society programs. Some of them he did, but there were other ones that got reduced, so they were made smaller. Okay, so not such a big uh, a cost or such a big expansive program. But with other programs, um, he didn't eliminate them, but instead gave federal or gave states a lot more power over them. Uh, so, for example, uh, the food stamp program is a great example of this. Um, today, since Nixon's time, the food stamp program, the money comes from the federal government, right? So the federal government raises the money and appropriates the money. But as far as like how the food stamp program runs, that each state has the power to decide how to run the food stamp program. So that means that they can decide who gets benefits and who doesn't. So what the cutoff line is for income, what kinds are, how much they can get and maybe what specific kinds of goods they can get and not get. Um, and so these kind of specific rules are oftentimes made by the state governments and the federal government just gives the states the money, okay? So the states have a lot more power over how these welfare programs run and how the money is spent. Um, whereas before, before Nixon, the federal government made a lot of those decisions. So this was a way to kind of limit the power of the national government uh, while not getting rid of all of these programs, because a lot of these programs were very well liked by the American people. Now, the reason why we're seeing this happen, though, and the reason why there's so many places that are, are so much power for Nixon and, and, and support for Nixon is because the country is really starting to change by the late 1960s. This is best shown by the development of what we would call the Sun Belt. Okay? Now, we would, you know, talk about this being the South, okay? Um, and of course, it does include us, okay, in the Sun Belt. But we, we're, that term, the South, is a little tough for us in, the, in, in our history because when we used to talk about the South, we were really talking about like the Southeast, like the old Confederate states, okay? Um, now, um, this idea, though, the Sun Belt, it also included parts of the Southwest as well, okay? So Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. So not just the old Confederate states. Now, by the 1960s and moving to the 70s and the 80s, we're seeing that the South is starting to change and is starting to generally become more conservative um, for a few reasons. 
new military bases. Especially after World War II, a lot of new military bases are being built. Uh, most of these are in this area below the Sun Belt uh, for no particular reason other than better weather, right? So if it's like an Air Force military base, you know, you need to be able to do those missions year-round, and the better weather happens a little bit further south in the United States, okay? So that's one reason. But we see that, generally speaking, when we talk about members of the military, they are generally more conservative. They generally don't like to see big changes in the government. Uh, we see more corporate headquarters moving south because of lower tax rates. Certain states in the south, like Florida and Texas, they have no state income tax. Uh, so you keep a lot more of your money, a lot uh, fewer, uh, a lot less paid in taxes, both for corporations and individuals. So they start to come down, and we see that generally these corporations and a lot of the people that work at the corporations are generally more conservative. Retirees, um, older folks, move to two places in the, in, uh, in the Sun Belt region, Florida and Arizona. Most of the older folks are moving to states like Florida and Arizona because the weather is better. They don't want to deal with snow anymore. But generally speaking, older folks are generally more conservative. Okay, And then one last one, and this definitely can't be understated, but here in the former Confederacy, there are a lot of white folks um, who are uh, frustrated due to civil rights. Okay, And, and to be honest, this isn't just folks who are just out-and-out out racists, okay? Some of them are. But others in this group, they think that civil rights has gone far enough, and as the civil rights movement's beginning to change and becoming a little bit more radical, some white folks in the South are starting to kind of push against it, okay? And they push against programs like busing programs to kind of move um, uh, students far away from their local home school to make segregated or to make desegregated integrated schools, um, and so we see that this begins to start all of this together a pushback, a conservative pushback in the government. Now Nixon is the one who kind of sees this as an opportunity, and he sees that he can get a lot of these Southerners, who most of these Southerners had only ever voted for Democrats all their life, okay, and try to persuade them to support the Republican Party. Now, to do this, Nixon does a couple things. One, he opposes new civil rights policies. Now, Nixon does not try to undo the civil rights policies that have been passed. He doesn't try to reinstate segregation. That's not really, you know, something he could even do if he wanted to. But he can make promises to not pass new civil rights legislation. And Nixon does that. Nixon doesn't pass new civil rights stuff in the 70s while he's president. But also, cutting government spending as these more conservative folks generally don't want too much government spending. And he is able to start getting Southerners to support the Republican Party, which is pretty crazy given that most Southerners had only ever voted for Democrats from before and then after the Civil War. So we start to see the Sun Belt change from liberal to conservative. So let's look at a few of presidential elections. So this is the 1940 presidential election, uh, uh, which was between uh, Franklin Roosevelt running for his third term as president versus Republican Wendell Wilkie. We see that uh, below that yellow line, the Sun Belt, easily Roosevelt wins most of the counties south of that yellow line. So we see that generally they are supporting a more liberal candidate in FDR. Eight, we move forward eight years. We see it this this is when Truman is running for his own term as president against the Republican Thomas Dewey, uh, with an important third party candidate, Strom Thurmond, Senator Strom Thurmond from South Carolina, running as a Dixiecrat. He's running as a uh, kind of as a Democrat, but one that is pro segregation, uh, and uh, Thurmond is kind of leading this because of of actions that Truman took to kind of integrate the military, among other things. A few southern states go towards Thurman, but most of the southern states still go to Truman. Truman wins in 1948. Now 1960. 
You see that this is Kennedy versus Nixon. We talked about this at the beginning of Unit 13. Now, Kennedy still wins most of the southern states. He wins uh, Georgia, Alabama. He wins Texas. But you see, it's not nearly so much of a slam dunk. And especially out in the West, we're seeing this change already occur. Nixon was from California, so he had a lot of support in Southern California. Now, here is 1968. This is the election that Nixon won to become president. Now, you see, at this point, support for Democrats in the South is really going away. Very few uh, Southern states uh, had uh, support, large support for the Democratic candidate Hubert Humphrey. He didn't win a single Southern state. There was an important third party candidate, George Wallace, for the American Independent Party. He was a former governor of the state of Alabama during all their civil rights crises, and he runs as a uh, pro segregation independent candidate. So he wins several Southern states. But in 1972, most of those Southern states would go to Nixon. So you see here Nixon winning a landslide victory over the Democratic candidate George McGovern. And now we're going to flash forward to much closer in time, 2008, uh, the election uh, between Democrat Barack Obama and Republican John McCain. By this point, you see that with a few exceptions, large parts of the South are now firmly in a Republican column. And this is something that is still... The, the situation today, and in fact why it was so surprising to see our home state vote for a Democratic candidate in the 2020 election, uh, mostly because of these changes that we've seen develop over a long span of time in American history. Now we're going to change our focus from domestic policy now to foreign policy, where Nixon has a lot of, of influence domestically, but his foreign policy is a much bigger deal while he's president. And Nixon's going to come in and very much change our foreign policy as we move into the 1970s. Now, we see Nixon, generally speaking, is going to be moving from the position of containment, where we had been basically since the end of World War II, trying to contain the spread of communism, uh, which often led to more increases of tension between the Soviet Union and the United States. Instead, Nixon, he goes a different route, and he tries to use a policy of what we would call detente. Now, detente is a French word. What it means in English is basically to ease tensions, to basically calm everybody down, right? And that was Nixon's basic policy, try to ease tensions with our Cold War enemies, which, yes, was the Soviet Union, but there were others as well. Now, the guy probably most helpful in developing this policy would be uh, uh, Nixon's national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, who does a lot of the work to kind of organize this foreign policy and you know visits with leaders across the world. Now, the basic idea of Nixon's foreign policy is what would be called triangular diplomacy, basically looking at three of our most important uh, uh, rivals in uh, in the world at that time, and trying to figure out how we could use policies uh, for those three to kind of help us with our overall uh, uh, policy. Okay. Now, as it implies, there are three points to the triangle. Okay. The Soviet Union, which you probably wouldn't expect, is probably one of the most important ones. But also Vietnam, which was a, uh, a problem that we were dealing with uh, that dealt with a communist country in this Cold War. And then also China, another communist country that we uh, need to deal with. Now, we'll start with Vietnam, because Vietnam is ongoing as Nixon enters the war. And this was one reason why um, Nixon was able to win election in 1968, is because of his message. Now, by 1968... It's pretty clear even folks that aren't hippies are starting not to support the Vietnam War, okay? It's not just the folks out there in the streets. There are regular Americans who are starting to question, like, why are we there and how long are we going to be there? And so Nixon appeals to fo these folks by saying, we're going to leave Vietnam, but we will have peace with honor. So what he means is that we're not going to just, like, leave our allies, the South Vietnamese, alone. We're not going to just bail on them. But we are going to try to seek peace as soon as possible. Now, we see that 
Um, in the end, Nixon is going to try to push off a lot of these things to the South Vietnamese. This would be a process that we call Vietnamization. But it doesn't go so smoothly, and instead uh, we will actually grow the Vietnam War while Nixon is president. Um, now, by 1973, though, there is a ceasefire where U.S. troops will withdraw and the Vietnam War would start to come to an end. So let's kind of talk about this a little bit more. Now, Vietnamization, it's a good name because it's something that makes sense, you know, to us based on the name. Essentially, what Nixon's saying needs to happen is we need to gradually withdraw U.S. troops and replace them with South Vietnamese soldiers who will be defending themselves from the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, okay? Now, this is what Nixon says publicly. But in private, we know Nixon was going for a different strategy. He was hoping to not land a knockout blow on the North Vietnamese and basically make it where they can't win or can't fight anymore, okay? Um, but he's going to do this in secret because, again, most Americans want the war to come to an end pretty quickly, and this is not really ending the war. This is, in a lot of ways, kind of growing the war, okay? Now, the biggest issue that Nixon faced with ending the war was this Ho Chi Minh Trail. The fact that North Vietnamese were using the jungles of Laos and Cambodia to get supplies and materials to their Viet Cong allies in the South. All right. Now, the plan to deal with this was pretty simple. Send U.S. troops into Cambodia and Laos and take out the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Bomb it, right, and stop this... Um, stop these materials going to the Viet Cong. Would have worked out okay if it remained secret, but it didn't, okay? And so when news of this came out in 1970 that Nixon was expanding the war, the largest protests of the entire Vietnam War era began, okay? And we see a quarter of a million people protest across the country. It's still mostly focused amongst young people on college campuses, but... It is very wide and across the country, and some of these turn violent. And we mentioned this at the end of Unit 13. Probably the most notable example is at Kent State University when four students died during protests there after the National Guard opens fire into anti-Vietnam War protests. Now, this leads Nixon and his administration to dial it back even more, and within a couple of years... The U.S. and the North Vietnamese are agreeing to a ceasefire that would withdraw the United States from Vietnam once and for all. And we're hoping the ceasefire will just keep the peace. There is not going to be one united Vietnam under this plan. There would still be a North and South Vietnam. But at least this is an end to the fighting. With that said, though, that is not how it works out long term. Now, within a couple years we will see the North Vietnamese invade. They violate the ceasefire, invade South Vietnam, and then unite the government under one communist government. Now, this is an iconic image of the, the last Americans in Saigon leaving the U.S. Embassy to go back to the United States in 1975. The war would end, and this is what Vietnam looks like today. One Singular Vietnam under a communist government, and that is how it remains today. Now, the Vietnam War is, at that point, the longest war in American history. Today, we have now been in the war in Afghanistan longer than Vietnam, but at that time, Vietnam was the longest war we had been into, and it is certainly the most divisive war in U.S. history. Uh, that is probably still true today. Uh, this is something you may may recognize if you've ever been there to Washington, D.C., but this is the uh, Vietnam Wall Memorial at uh, in Washington, D.C., on the National Mall. Um, what you see here, it's a very simple monument, just with names uh, of soldiers that died or went missing in action in Vietnam. Um, and we see it, it's kind of, it's cut into a hill, so like on either end, it's very small, like, as you can kind of see, like, you can't tell in the image, 
but it's not just kind of the wall getting away from you, but it's also actually getting smaller. So like at one end, like it's like really short, like right at your, your legs. But eventually as you get into the middle, the wall is really big. And what it represents is at one end, the first Americans to die in Vietnam starting in the 1950s, and at the other end, the last few Americans to die in Vietnam in the, the mid-1970s, and then the middle is around 1968, where the most Americans would be dying in Vietnam. Very, very moving uh, memorial, and if you ever go to Washington, D.C., I would definitely say check it out. Now, by the end of the war, 3.3 million Americans will serve in Vietnam. Now, of those 3.3 million, 58,000 would be killed. Okay, so that's not a lot in comparison to wars like the World Wars. Obviously, by the 70s, our medical technology is a lot better. Um, and so a lot of the folks who were wounded, just over 300,000, uh, they probably, in other wars before this, they may have passed away, but they were able to be saved, okay? Now, with that said, though, that does not mean that the wounded nor the folks who come back physically, okay, are actually totally okay. We see that around 15% of Vietnam vets will be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, it's very possible more than 15% had it um, as we start to understand the impacts of traumatic events like warfare on human beings and our brains and how we think and how we react to stuff. Um, and we see that the vets, some of them face hostility. Uh, there are stories of, of vets being spit on as they come home. Those are a little bit more apocryphal, like there aren't great examples of that. But also at the same time, the vets are not treated like heroes like the guys coming home from World War II were, um, and a lot of them come back with problems, and still today, large proportions of, 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 of older homeless populations are, are Vietnam War vets. Yeah. It also changes our foreign policy. We see that containment by the end of Vietnam War, it's over, okay? Uh, because we now see that this comes at a cost, right? Trying to contain the spread of communism. We, it may come at a cost that's too high for us to pay, all right? And so a lot of Americans are going to be very cautious of our role in the world and getting involved in military conflicts. Um, and this would kind of continue until the 1990s, uh, this kind of fear to get into major military conflict again. We also see Congress kind of stepping in and saying, listen, we need to limit the power of the president a little bit. Um, and so in 1973, they passed the War Powers Act, which would limit the president's ability to send troops without a declaration of war. Basically, what the War Powers Act would do is it would give the president kind of the ability to send troops at a moment's notice, like say like some craziness is breaking out in one of our allies' countries. Like, we could send troops, but the president must ask for official uh, approval from Congress within a month. And if Congress does not a pro provide that approval, or the president doesn't get ask Congress for that approval, those troops have to come back home one way or another. Uh, so this kind of limits the president's power just to send troops as they see fit. Now here at home, we see that it's going to cause a lot of people to lose faith in the government, because they're not really going to see the government as honest, right? And it started during the Johnson years, where they said, hey, we're about to win the war, it's almost over. And then it was pretty clear, especially after the Tet Offensive, that that wasn't true. And then Nixon getting us involved and spreading the war until Cambodia and Laos secretly, but then getting found out, it makes a lot of people distrust the government, okay? The war also cost a ton of money, $166, uh, $176 billion. Um, that was a ton of money. Uh, it led to high inflation as um, our Money became less and less valuable, so you had to spend more and more of it to get the same goods uh, at the grocery store. And it also led to major cuts in London Johnson's Great Society programs because of this economic, these economic problems. Now, one good outcome of the Vietnam War would be that it makes it pretty clear that younger folks, they probably need to be given the right to participate in government a little bit more, Right. A lot of these younger folks on college campuses, most of them couldn't vote. 
Because at that point, the, the, you had to be 21 years of age to vote. That would change with the 26th Amendment. That would lower the voting age to 18, making it where you could vote at the same time you could be drafted to go into war, although they do end the draft after the Vietnam War. Now, if we looked at just that, you may perceive Nixon as a failure. But I want to be clear. Vietnam didn't fall. South Vietnam didn't fall until after Nixon left office. And so actually... A lot of these next couple things that happened in Nixon's time as president in foreign policy are remembered pretty well. Let's talk about China now. Now, we see that Nixon is going to really focus on much better relations with the Chinese government. And in 1972, he does something pretty crazy, and he visits China. The first president ever to visit uh, the, uh, China, uh, the Chinese under a communist government, as you see, here's Nixon meeting with Mao Zedong, the, the founder of communist China. Now, Nixon will, will uh, recognize China as the official government of mainland China, uh, kind of putting our allies, the Republic of Taiwan, to the side to open up better relations with China. And this really worked, okay? Now, it didn't happen all at once. But after Nixon visits China in 1972, we start passing trade deals with China to begin to trade goods back and forth. And this is something that has profoundly impacted us today because so many of our goods, like you know, our cell phones and other electronics, but also clothing and so on, many of them are made in China. Uh, and that is when that began in the mid-1970s. Now... To be clear, though, it wasn't just about trade, although that's probably the biggest impact. But there was a clear reason why we were focusing on China. I'm not going to get too much into it, but by the 1960s, the Soviet Union and the Chinese are kind of coming apart. Now, you would think that they'd be really close allies because they are both communist countries. But they had some differences in how their government was set up and you know, there was some, some rivalry there between those two as well. And this is where Nixon and Henry Kissinger see an opening. And they realize, like, hey, if we go in and try to get nice with China, that might force the Soviet Union to negotiate with us as well. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing to do is to try to ease tensions with the Soviet Union because they're the ones with the nuclear weapons. And this plan to kind of open up relations with China actually works. And after Nixon successfully visits China in 1972, the Soviets, they feel like they have to negotiate as well. And so uh, shortly afterwards, Nixon will end up negotiating with the now Soviet leader, Leonid Brezhnev, there he is, um, to negotiate. And the most important thing they're going to negotiate about is nuclear weapons. Now, that same year, 1972, Nixon is going to become the first president ever to visit Moscow. And there, they would uh, have the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, uh, the SALT Treaties, to limit the production of ICBMs. Now, we don't end up completely getting rid of the intercontinental ballistic missiles, no. But this is the first arms limitation treaty ever signed between the Soviet Union and and the United States it would be the building block for later ones that come in the 1980s. Now, at this point, we're basically at the end of Nixon's first term. He is setting up to run for re-election in 1972. And at the end of his first term, Nixon is pretty popular, okay? Now, we see those more conservative Americans, the silent majority, they are really happy about his domestic policies, Reducing government spending, uh, and so more middle class, conservative, and southern voters are really satisfied with that. But in our foreign policy, even some of Nixon's enemies really have to argue, like, he's doing a good job because the, in, the war in Vietnam by 1972 is starting to come to an end. Um, and tensions with both China and the Soviet Union are decreasing, and so we're at a less threat of nuclear war. And that what is what helps Nixon win a landslide victory in 1972. Uh, Nixon wins almost every single state in the Electoral College, except for Massachusetts, 
and then just like uh, uh, Washington, D.C., and then a couple of electoral votes here or there. This would give him 96.6 of the Electoral College votes, 520 out of a total of 538. In the popular vote, he destroys the, the Democratic candidate, uh, George McGovern, winning 60% of the popular vote, 47 million votes, to McGovern's 29 million. It is a rout. But things are going to accelerate quickly from there. Uh, during 72, the scandal, of uh, the Watergate scandal will break. And within two years of this victory, not even two full years, in 1974, Nixon will be resigning in the face of being possibly the first president ever to be impeached and removed from office. How does that happen? Why does that happen? Why do we remember Nixon as such a bad president now? This is where we start. Okay, Now take a look at this image and see what you see. We got down here the title, His Own Worst Enemy. This is supposed to be Nixon. And what does he have on his desk? This huge list of enemies, right? Looks like Santa's, like, you know, good and naughty list, but just the naughty folks on it. Hmm. This political cartoon shows us one of Nixon's most important problems as both an individual and as a leader. He is really insecure and paranoid. He thinks everyone's out to get him. They're all trying to undermine him and his presidency. Now, he would keep a list of actual enemies. This enemies list was an actual real thing. Okay, And this would be people out to undermine his policies. It could be Democratic uh, uh, leaders like Ted Kennedy from Massachusetts, one of the Kennedy brothers, but also like, like celebrities uh, Jane Fonda, a movie star, was very, very liberal, was on the list. Uh, other folks, uh, remembered for other reasons now today, but Bill Cosby, uh, who was a popular African-American stand-up comedian in the 1970s, was on the list. Again, remembered for different reasons today. Uh, but this list was, was long, long, because Nixon saw people out to get him everywhere. Now, we see that uh, Nixon, who will eventually get his nickname Tricky Dick because of some of the stuff that his underlings are going to pull off, um, he's going to use his power as the president to spy on people. He directs the FBI to spy on civil rights activists and these other so-called enemies. Uh, and in some cases, he was going to have the law enforcement folks infiltrate and sabotage enemies. Okay. Now, all of these things were going on throughout Nixon's presidency. But there's only one incident we really talk about, and that is the Watergate scandal, which is just one example of this kind of infiltration and sabotage that Nixon's uh, administration did. Okay? Now, I want to talk a little bit about the Watergate. Now, this term gate has been used for like basically every scandal since the 1970s. But we call it the Watergate because that's the actual name of this. This is a hotel and office complex in Washington, D.C. And it was important because that is the, where the headquarters for the Democratic National Committee and McGovern's campaign were in 1972. Okay? Now, in 1972, the summer of 72, these five men were caught breaking into the Democratic National Committee's offices in the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. Um, they uh, brought, were brought together, or these five men, we don't know why yet, uh, but they were brought together to go in and try to get information from, uh, the, uh, from, from the Democratic National Committee that could be used in the election later that fall. But they were very sloppy, they got caught by a security guard, and then these five guys got arrested. Now, when they were arraigned, where they were brought up on charges in front of a judge, the judge asked them, and judge asks, you know, stuff like this, like basic information, like, you know, who are you, what's your name, who's your employer, and stuff. But these guys had some weird answers, okay? Turns out several of them are Cuban exiles that had left Cuba after Castro came to power. And a couple of them said their most recent employer was the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, 
what? Like former guys that work for the CIA are breaking into an uh, office complex? What's going on? Now, in time, these five guys are going to be connected to this guy, G. Gordon Liddy. Okay, and now you're getting closer to Nixon. Uh, now, Liddy was uh, uh, connected to Nixon, had worked on Nixon's campaigns, and it turns out Liddy had gotten money from the Committee to Re-Elect the President, the President's Re-Election Committee in 1972, and donations that Americans sent to uh, this committee, which was called CREEP for short, yeah, ironic, actually was used and sent to these uh, uh, five burglars uh, that were part of what Liddy's team called the plumbers. Now, this is when the questions really start to arise. Like, okay, if Liddy knew about this break-in, it seems like if Nixon didn't actually, like, approve this, at the very least, some folks much closer to Nixon had to know about it. And so then the focus turns to Nixon's inner circle, like his chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, his chief domestic advisor, John Ehrlichman, his attorney general, John Mitchell, his counsel, John Dean. These guys, who are also really important in Nixon's re-election effort, they may have known about this, and now the question is, what do they know? Now, all of this information, all these connections, they weren't being made by our own government. Instead, they were being made by journalists, most notably these two guys, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, who were both two young journalists at the Washington Post uh, during this period, uh, the early 1970s. And in a series of articles in the Post, they continue to make these connections that keep kind of showing that if Nixon himself wasn't involved in the Watergate, he is almost assuredly involved in the cover-up of the break-in to try to make it look like he had nothing to do with it. But the thing is, is that he continues to say, as we go uh, into 72, into 73, Nixon says, listen, I had nothing to do with this. Now, eventually he has to say, yeah, maybe my subordinates did some bad stuff, but I knew nothing about this. Okay? Now we move forward into 73, into 74. Now, eventually, one of Nixon's folks in the inner circle gets cold feet, John Dean. And during congressional testimony, he actually admits that Nixon knew about the Watergate cover-up much sooner than he said he did. And this starts to set up alarm bells, like, whoa, what's going on? What did the president know, and when did he really know this stuff? But the president keeps denying that he knew anything. Now, another uh, person is called to testify uh, in front of Congress about uh, the Watergate break-in. And this person also provides some other really important information. Uh, they're asked uh, if there are perhaps any like documents that might show when Nixon knew about Watergate. And this staffer in the White House says, well, I don't know about documents, but I know there was a tape system in the White House which makes the congressional investigators say, what? They hadn't known this. Now, it turns out there was a tape system set up in the White House, uh, first set up by President Lyndon Johnson, uh, but then um, we would then see the uh, uh, Nixon administration pick it up. Now, it turns out Nixon liked to get uh, his conversations recorded because that would be a good way for him to remember what promises people had made to him so he knew to call them in. But when these tapes become public knowledge, well, people want to hear what's on the tapes because that could prove what Nixon knew and didn't know, okay? But Nixon does not want to turn over the tapes. He says the tapes are part of executive privilege and they have important information that can't be released to Congress or the Supreme Court. So he refuses to turn them over. Well, at this point, Congress will say, nuh-uh, and they sue Nixon. And then all of a sudden, here comes our third branch of government, the Supreme Court, having to make the decision. Does Nixon have to turn over the tapes or not? The Supreme Court says President Nixon has to turn over the tapes. And so Nick Congress, as we move into 1974, is getting these tapes and beginning to listen to them. Now, 
It takes some time to go through all the tapes, but it becomes pretty clear by the summer of 1974 that if Nixon, based on recordings, if he didn't know about the Watergate break-in before the break-in, he certainly knew about it right after, and he told his underlings to cover it up. Now, there was a missing piece of tape on, on the tapes that get turned in, an infamous 17-minute piece of tape that was just missing. Some folks would argue that this is the part where Nixon actually authorizes the Watergate break-in, but we'll never really know because that tape is gone. But it doesn't really matter because there's enough information to actually imply that Nixon, if he didn't say to break into the Watergate and get that info, he at least knew about it and tried to cover it up after the fact. It's getting to the point that some members of his own party in the Senate are starting to tell Nixon, listen, we, we can't protect you anymore. It's getting too bad. The House is starting to file uh, articles of impeachment, which are kind of laying down the precise charges that Nixon would be charged with. Those are absolutely going to go through the House. And if it goes to the Senate, these Republicans in the Senate are saying, listen, we're going to have to say you're guilty because like, it's obvious that you are. Nixon staring right in the face to be the first president ever removed from office. So he decides in August of 1974 to just go ahead and resign, becoming the first president ever to resign from the presidency. Now with that, we're going to have a new president, President Gerald Ford. Now Ford was actually an interesting character because Ford was not Nixon's first vice president. In fact, and this is not making this up, Nixon's original vice president had to resign. Now, his was for a different issue. He was not paying his taxes, and he almost got away with it until he got caught. So Ford has an interesting story. He was chosen by Nixon to be his vice president, um, and the president can just appoint vice presidents if his vice president dies or, or otherwise quits. And so he chose Ford because Ford was remembered as a very honest and forthright man. But this would also mean that Ford now is going to become president. And that would make Ford the, the, the first and only guy to ever serve as president without either running for presidency or vice presidency. Now, the Watergate scandal absolutely changed America forever. Okay, And we already saw, especially due to the war in Vietnam, there was a lot of erosion of public trust in political leaders. The Watergate scandal kills that forever. Okay, and ever since, really, for the most part, distrust of politicians is kind of the the, the baseline for most politics today. Uh, that you know, politicians never do what they say; they always lie; they always do these things. Americans didn't really all believe that before Watergate, but increasingly, and still through today, many do. It also set up the role of the media as a watchdog of the government, like actually like showing like, hey, this is what the government's doing and kind of illuminating these things. Uh, it also leads to Congress kind of taking on more leadership, okay, seeing that maybe we can't let the president do everything or just by themselves. But there is one big piece of uncertainty as Nixon leaves office. Now, all these things, we were talking about whether Nixon should be removed from the presidency or not. That was all those impeachment articles were intended to deal with. But there is a big question, because if Nixon did this cover-up, he might not just be you know, good to kick out of office. He maybe actually committed some crimes. And so there's a big question of whether Nixon's going to serve jail time in relation to Watergate. We don't really know, but now we have a new president. We're going to have to figure it out. But we'll leave it there for now. And we'll come back next time to talk about the presidency of Gerald Ford and then talk about the presidency of his successor, Jimmy Carter from the state of Georgia. But we're going to leave it there for today, and we'll see you next time. Bye.